Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Carolina. Thanks for attending this virtual event organized by Word Up Community Bookshop. During this event, feel free to add comments in the chat panel, which you can access by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen. You can also add your Q and A uh, questions there. Um, I'll be monitoring it, and then at the end, we'll be asking questions. Um, and if you're on Facebook, feel free to comment, and we'll bring those into the chat room in Zoom. Um, <laughs> If you don't know, Word Up, we're a bookshop and art space run by local residents, many of whom are volunteers. We started as a one month long pop-up shop in 2011, then stuck around due to overwhelming community demand. This past June, we celebrated our 10th birthday. We can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in Washington Heights, New York City. We host events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. So check us out at wordupbooks.com to shop and see other virtual and outdoor events that we have. And some of them are pretty exciting. So I'll let you know at the end of this event. We are open Tuesday through Friday, 12 to 6 p.m. and Saturday, 11 to 5 p.m. Um, and we hope to check you, uh, see you guys there. And tonight we're really excited to have Pamela Laskin, um, who's a local author, a teacher to some of our collective members um, and someone that we joyfully always have at Word Up. Um, if you don't know, Pamela Laskin is a lecturer in the English department at City College, where she teaches, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate children's writing and directs the Poetry Outreach Center. Several of her children's books and poetry books have been published, including Roni and Jamil, um, Bea, and Why No Bean, which are all available at wordupbooks.com. Um, and thank you. Hi, Pamela. <laughs> okay, it's a host disabled participant sharing. So what does that mean? Just question, Carolyn. Oh, I can, here, I can let you. Um, were you gonna share something? Actually, no. So I, okay. I'm reading from the book now that I think about it. So I'm ready. Should I go into speaker view, Carolina? Sure, yeah, I'll I'll put you there. Hold on. Okay. I and thank you, Carolina and Word Up Bookstore. I have a long-standing relationship, as Carolina said, with the bookstore because some of my MFA students work there. One of them actually, um, Veronica Lou, started the bookstore, and I have great admiration for her. And some of my students have been interns there and continue to work there afterwards, including Robbie, who's not there tonight. I wanna, a, I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight. I'm so grateful to have you all here. Uh, it's, I had assumed that this would be in person. Of course it's not, but the great thing about it not being in person and online is people can come from all over. I have. Amber from the Carolinas, Addie from Austin. It's just, it's quite, Karen from Nyack. It's quite remarkable. So thank you one and all. And right, and Amber, I wanna say something special before I start, because Amber today posted something on Instagram, which um, she wrote the blurb for my book and today on Instagram, she wrote, which was quite overwhelming. It was a, a shout out for my book. And she said, The Lost Language of Crazy, Pam Laskin, one of the most beautiful books I've read all year. Amber has written so many incredible books and has a so whole series coming out in the new year about doggies. And that's for all the dog lovers in the house. A contemporary middle grade novel about family, friendship, mental illness, finding your voice through writing and more. Swipe for the full book description and all the information about Pam's book. And if you read that, you'll also see that there's yet another blurb from my co-teacher, Suzanne Wayne, who may or may not be here. The history of this book my agent had said to me, why don't you start writing your own story and stop writing about other people, which was really probably 
excellent advice, of course. When that happened, she said, you know what I want? And she gave me dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of changes if she were to represent my book, at which point I said, you know what? You're not representing this book. I'll, I'll find an editor and publisher on my own, which I did in, of all places, Boston, Texas. Shout out to Addie for that. And it was Discover This Press, Atmosphere Press, at a, in San Antonio, Texas, pre-COVID, or I should say on the cusp of COVID, as we now say AC and BC. I'm going to read you, give you a brief description, read from it, and then in the end, have a Q and A. And it should be about an hour in total. This is a fictional account of my life. And by fiction, I it, it talks about my biological mother's mental illness, but it says that that mental illness also became my own, which it did not, though I certainly think it affected me profoundly and psychologically in so many ways. However, I was never mute. Some of the things you might read when um, in the book, if you read it. And I never ended up in an institution, but I definitely suffered the trauma of growing up in that kind of household. And the premise of the book is a young girl who is asked to write a play and it, the teacher wants to cast the past, a whole vision of how the play should be cast and the awards it should win. But the girl feels she's not ready to do any of that because the play is not finished. And the idea is she doesn't really know what the story is until she discovers the story. And really by saying that the premise is she doesn't really know um, what her mother's story is other than what her father told her, which is that her mother was deceased. It's not what my father told me. I knew that my mother was alive and also was institutionalized, but I also did not know and discovered a diary of hers, which I wish I had saved, but I didn't. But my memories of that diary and the excerpts I read were, um, they'll be self-explanatory in the book, but I may not get to read all of that, was that she was definitely a schizophrenic woman. However, she also was a person who was not satisfied in the role and the world that she said that she embarked on, which was she probably shouldn't have gotten married. She shouldn't have children. And she was also very interested in um, doing things that were not encouraged for her as a woman. She liked mechanical things, fixing things. She liked plumbing. And I think that was pushed by her family to be a conventional stepper, Stepford wife, which she did very unsuccessfully. And so I begin in Penny's voice and Penny's voice is my own. And my own younger voice and my discovery to become a writer. And I will read you the epigraph, two epigraphs. One is from a poem memory by Shara McCallum from the New York Times. I bruise the way the most secreted, secreted most tender part of a thigh exposed purples than blues. No split shine shoes, I'm dirt you can't wash from your feet. Wherever you go, know I'm the wind accosting the trees, the howling night of your sea. Try to leave me. I'll pin you between a rock and a hard place. We'll hunt you, even as you erase your tracks with the tail ends of your skirt. You think I'm gristle, begging to be chewed? No, my love, I'm bone. Rather, the sound bone makes when it snaps. That ditty 
lingering in you like room. And the other um, epigraph is from Ron Power's book, No One Cares About Crazy People. I have sometimes imagined my own sanity as resting on the surface of a membrane, a thin and fragile membrane that can easily be ripped open, plunging me into an abyss of madness where I can join the tumbling souls whose membranes have likewise been pierced over the ages. Prologue. I was only two and a half when my mother disappeared or died. But what I remember is that she loved beautiful, beautiful boy things such as fixing cars and plumbing. And she wrote poetry under the name Stavon, though her name was Star. She told me everyone has a story, even me. Chapter one. And what I do is I use a lot of forms in this book. And some of the forms are a blog, um, footnotes, a lot of footnotes that reference the word crazy, um, notes from a psychiatric hospital, and different poetic forms. I use poems. I use poetic form poems, and you will see, or you will hear. In this case, you will hear. Chapter one, if I can't play the father, you can't use my play, I tell my teacher, Mrs. Rice. You don't understand, Rice insists. You enter this play in a competition, and it won. Part of the prize is to have a theater department do a production of your play. That was explained clearly in the entry information. There was nothing that said you could get to pick a role for yourself. It shouldn't have won. It's not finished. It needs a new ending. But it did win, Rise's eyes plead. You can change the ending. Rise is the middle school drama teacher, one of the best, though we get into disagreements sometimes. She takes her job very seriously. Silence. We sit on it together. I can wait this out better than she can. Dad says I'm the most stubborn person he knows. Ms. Ms. Rise is crazy if she thinks otherwise. What's going on here? What's really behind this, Penelope? She asks, finally. Pilar, remember I changed my name? Rise rolls her eyes. Pilar, nothing is behind it. I told you I want to play the dad. If I can do that and you could let me change the end, you can use it. You're the writer, not an actor. Performances are for our theater students. And besides, don't you think a boy should play the father? No, I believe in colorblind and genderblind casting. I read it in the arts and entertainment section of my dad's New York Times. I was 11, but it sounded cool. It's only the only part I like to read in the newspaper, even now. Rise sighs. She knows she is lost. Inwardly, I beam, proud of my quick gender blind, color blind response. I really do believe in those things, but I can't always get the right words out fast like that. Rise is used to quick witted kids. After all, this is middle school 55 in Brooklyn. School for the gifted and talented, probably a word I wouldn't use now, but mostly science geeks and freaks. A few goths and wannabe artists, people with names like Gadsby, Brooklyn, Marigold. It's not being performed till late November or early December. Why don't you think about it? Rice presses on. You don't understand. No, I don't, Penny. Pilar, I correct her again. Pilar, I like changing my name every year. This started in sixth grade, and now that I am in eighth grade, I have found the perfect name for me. For now, I know this seems crazy, but it works and everyone sort of adapts. Okay, whatever. Can you at least think about it? You can finish it with the ending that you like. I'll think about it. I have to think about it because I have no idea what the ending should be. I know only know that the play is not finished. She nods and I hurry from the room, eager to leave the drama behind. This is the first blog where happy little bluebirds fly, and it's called www.overtherainbow.blogspot.com. 
Welcome to my blog, whose name is Over the Rainbow. You can follow me on this or on Twitter, overtherainbow.com. I name my blog this because I am a super fan of The Wizard of Oz, and I think there is a lot that can be learned about life in that movie. This is a free, safe space where we can talk about anything, where happy little bluebirds fly. I'm a, I am Pilar, also known as Penelope. Some people call me Penny, though I correct them. There are people who change shoes often, but that is not me. I prefer my plain white kids. What I do like to change, though, is my name. Maybe once a year, since a new name helps me figure out who I am supposed to be at any given time. Right now, I am using my Spanish, the name my Spanish teacher gave me, Pilar. It is taken from the Virgin Mary, which means nothing to me, so I make believe it means strength. I am stronger than people think I am. The Wizard of Oz is an all I will be talking about on this blog. I want to tell you about all that I see and do. If Toto helps us make sense of it, that's even better. I think of myself as a writer, so sometimes I'll talk about my writing. Other times I will talk about my friends, family, and people I know. Chapter two. So what's happening, Zena asks, as we come out of the building at dismissal time? We blend with the crowd of departing students until we branch off to a side street that fewer kids use on their way home. Why did Rice want to see you? Zena and I don't have any classes together after lunch, so I haven't had a chance to tell her about my meeting yet. Oh, okay. I won some stupid award for a play I submitted. Oh my God, oh my God, what award. That is so exciting, I can't believe it. Zena has been in this country over two years and she be, she's becoming so American. I mean, so American. She thinks awards are the best. She dresses like a Muslim American girl, though lately she has been pushing things, replacing her long skirts with jeans. She's even considered taking off her headscarf, her hijab, but so far it's all talk. I hope she doesn't. She wears the prettiest scarves and swirling colors that highlight her blue eyes. I can't imagine my friend dressed any other way. So I guess you could just say, I like it. It's a characteristic part of Zena. She complains that people give her funny looks and treat her like she's not American because of how she has to dress. I get that being treated weirdly because people think you're different is super uncomfortable. One of the nice things about Zena is how happy she gets when good stuff happens to her friends. She's jumping up and down. It's an award, Pilar, she says. It's an honor. The award thing is sort of complicated, I say. Why? The play is not finished, at least not in the way I'm happy with, but it won, Zena points out. I'm going to skip a little because I want to make sure that you hear sections of the diary, but I'll move to the end of the chapter. Um, it, and she speaks to her friend and says, after Rise told me about the award and how she wanted the play performed on the day of the award celebration, I told her only if I could play the lead and she gave me a flat out no. I understand it's a story about your life. You're the best person to play yourself. Not exactly, I say, I don't want to play myself. I want to play the dad. What? Why? I shrug. It's more interesting. I already know what's in my mind. I want to explore what's inside him. She studies me. She narrows her eyes and purses her lips. That's deep, Pilar. I'm relieved because I was expecting an argument or maybe even rid ridicule. So why won't she let you play the father? She said, first of all, they have a theater department. And second of all, boys should play bo boys and girls should play girls. So I'm not letting her use the piece since she won't let me play the dad. Kids will make fun of you if you play the dad. Some will, you know that, so let them. Some kids might make online cracks. Most of them are used to me going my own way. It wouldn't exactly be a shock. Maybe Rise will change her mind, Zena suggests. She won't, but I'm just as stubborn, neither will I. Second blog entry, a victim of disorganized thinking. The Wizard of Oz tells the cowardly lion that he is a victim of disorganized thinking. 
I can relate to that. Maybe that's my problem too. Maybe my thinking is simply disorganized. I have to find the right ending for my play. I really do. I wish I knew where it was going, but I don't. I have no idea what the future is. Like if there is no mom in my play, why doesn't my dad get a wife in real life? Really, what's his story? Maybe if he brought one home, I wouldn't even know what to do with her. Should a man who seems disinterested in a wife in real life have a wife in my play? I am having a hard time figuring out what to do as a writer. I need to figure out what this play is really about. Is it about my mother's death? Is it about my mother's death and how it has messed up my dad and me? Has it messed us up? Maybe we're just fine without her. Is it about how I miss my mother? Do I miss my mother? I never knew her. Are we happy? I don't even know. Or maybe we are really screwed up and don't even know it. Maybe the dad in the play needs a wife, even though the dad in real life will not get one. The play just isn't finished. I can feel that in a way I can't describe. It needs something more. I'm going to share excerpts from the diary that she discovers when she's looking for money that she needs to go out to dinner because there's nothing in the house, there's nothing in the refrigerator, and she has no money to order in. And they're just excerpts, they're snippets, and I'll read you some of those snippets. I can't put down my mother's diary. I lie across my bed, my head held in one hand. Her words are not always easy to follow. Her thinking is disjointed and chaotic. Most confusing is the fact that sometimes she refers to herself as Staven, and then she becomes Star. Then out of nowhere, she talks about Mr. Lasky. It seems as if she is not referring to dad, but herself. What, she is three people? The things she is writing are so weird. I'm not sure I understand them. My soul floats out of my body. It's a man's soul in a woman's body. No one ever lets me be a man. I love Charles, but I am the one who wears the pants, who abhors cooking and cleaning, who loves plumbing, woodworking, wearing men's clothes. Could I star, marry a woman and be a man? My brothers and sisters tell me no, but Charles is the woman I have dreamed of. This really was my dad. Cooking, cleaning, singing show tunes in the kitchen. He could be the wife and I could be the husband. My mother tells me, this is all in her voice and some of these are real expert excerpts. No, no, you have a great fiance. Do not blow it, Star. He will buy you a diamond ring. Keep that man thing a secret. Zip it up. The diamond will glitter on your finger. Actually, I want to be a bride a bride, a man, or a writer. I want to wear a long white veil, 50 feet long, attack of the 50 foot woman. What is she talking about? Why is she bringing up a horror film? This doesn't make sense. It seems from the parts I am reading that she did not love my dad or she didn't want to be married, but maybe she did, but maybe not to a man. And when I am a bride, I will have the most gorgeous white gown with pearl buttons adorning every inch of it. The buttons will be like eyes. They will see right through me. Um, I always knew I was different growing up. I had very few friends. I mostly liked to stay in my room and write reams and reams of paper. I even wrote on napkins, on toilet paper, so many stories bursting through the seams. Maybe Charles can have the baby he is dying for. All he ever talks about is that he wants children. Well, let him have them. Now I am pregnant. I am scared of this baby since lately I am hearing more and more voices. The voices tell me to get rid of the baby. They yell at me and I yell right back. Charles tells me to quit my job, so I do, since it is too much of a woman's job. And you know how I feel about that. He said I should relax more, that maybe I will make the voices stop. What I don't tell him is that I like the voices. They are my friends. Um, suddenly, she is too. The baby's born. I'm moving ahead in the diary. It is winter. I miss the warmth. I dress like the man since the voices, which have returned, 
say I can be whatever I want to be. I do not tell Charles my voices are back because he, who, he will make me go away again if he knows. It is so terribly cold outside and Penny loves to play in the snow. I hate, hate, hate winter. The voices tell me to kill her so I don't have to take her out in the snow, but I'm her mother, so I dress her warmly and hurry her out the door in case I start to believe the voices. Outside, she will be safe from me. I must keep her safe from me. I am the mother of her father. Um, and the list goes on. And at this point, she's so furious at her father and they go to a school event and at the school event, her play is performed, a section of her play. No one asked her, they went ahead and did it. And at this point, she starts to write in her journal over the rainbow block number 11. This award is a charade. I don't know what I feel. I also don't know what I am. The play is not finished, so why am I getting this lame award anyway? I am in the middle of trying to come up with an appropriate title for my event from The Wizard of Oz when I hear, and before we honor eighth grader Penelope Las Lasky with the Budding Writer Award, we have a small scene to share with you. I whip around, what scene, I ask my dad. From your unfinished play, he smiles happily. Pardon me, I snap. Miss Rice begged me, and I said I knew you'd be thrilled. I look up at the stage, and there are my alleged friends, Ava and Calvin, playing me and Dad, respectively. I suspect Johnny turned down the role of the dad, since he knew how I felt. This is what all the hand flapping was about. I let it sink in, sink into me like a knife. I didn't give Rice permission. I hiss in a high-pitched whisper. I did, he says. The heat in my head turns instantly to ice. The words from the diary start thumping away in my head. How dare he? How dare he? How dare he? Which is actually something that her mother said when she realizes that her father is trying to get her committed. This can't be read. You did, you gave her permission. It isn't yours, I say. You had no right to give permission. I thought you'd be happy afterwards. It's not your play. My heart races, not your play. I start trembling uncontrollably. I'm ready to run, but instead I slide from my chair onto my knees. The room spins. There's an outraged creature in my head clawing its way out. It's wild to escape. I have to let it out. I fall backward, banging my head against the floor. Slam. The creature in my head keeps me pinned there. It is banging its way out of my head, fueled by fire and rage. It bangs and bangs, frantic to escape. I have to keep on banging, though I can feel people trying to pull me away from the floor. I open my mouth to scream, but nothing comes out. It is stuck inside. And now I understand I am really crazy, crazy, crazy. And in the second half of the book, at least in the beginning, the narrator, Penny, loses her voice. It's diagnosed as selective mutism. And all she can do is write. But at a certain point, she doesn't even feel like doing that. And I'll just conclude with this final blog. It's at this point in the book that I rely on footnotes to define crazy. And when I started using this as a technique, one of the things I discovered is there are so many definitions of crazy. I'll just read you a few of them. Crazy, wild, crazy, a word used to describe many different conditions. Crazy, hard to understand. Crazy, ridiculous. Crazy, totally unexpected. Crazy, deranged, crazy, insane. Um, crazy, a wild outburst of deranged thinking. These are all 
definitions, crazy, empty, crazy, deceitful, out of control, insane, bonkers, and on and on. And the second half of the book is filled with footnotes which reference crazy. But when she is in the mood to write, she starts a new blog called The Lost Language of Crazy, hence the title of the book. Announcement. My blog will no longer be called Over the Rainbow. When I called it that, it seemed to me that all the wisdom of the world was contained in the Wizard of Oz. Things have happened to me since then, though. Things have gotten crazy, and now I am more interested in learning what crazy really means. We say it all the time, at least I do. What, though, do we really mean by it? The country is schizophrenic. The weather is schizophrenic. I wrote about this a while ago, before I ever knew my mother is schizophrenic. I haven't met her yet. She discovers her mother is alive and not dead. But her diary said she hears voices and they make her do wild, unpredictable, crazy things. Footnote 18, which is acknowledged at the bottom. My father has been filling in some of the blanks. He said one time she was shopping at Macy's. I wasn't even a year old. She went into the men's department store and was ready to steal a tuxedo. She insisted it belonged to her in another lifetime. This is a true story. Sometimes she is a king and sometimes she is a queen, a prince and a princess, a man and a woman. My dad said those voices told her to do frightening things when I was little. So he was really scared after a while to leave me alone with her. It seems like maybe if he let her be a man, she would have been just fine. But daddy says that may, that's making it way too simple. So maybe or maybe not. When I Googled schizophrenia, it said it is a real condition caused by the wiring in the brain. My friend insists her dad's wiring is off too, that he's schizophrenic too, but I don't think so. And this is Zena's dad. He is just sad, 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 and mad. Depression though, when it's severe and uncontrollable, is another mental illness. At least that's what I have read. When they went through my files, they discovered I had an episode of mutism when I was little, right after my mom left. Does that make me schizophrenic? This might be the last time I write for a very long time. It is getting me too upset. And Johnny is not like my mom. Johnny is her transgender friend who was once Jasmine. Johnny is not like my mom, my dad reminds me, because Johnny insists to make um, Penny feel better, that he also went a little crazy because people thought he had to be a girl and he was not a girl. Johnny has never been confused about who he is. My mom was, and schizophrenia may have had nothing to do with this confusion, or maybe it did. Thank you, everyone. I am now open to questions. Or not. And I guess if you have them, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Amber. Um, and feel free. By the way, Karen, who's right in front of my vision, is was also one of the helpful editors of this book. So thank you for um, Karen. Um, yes, so type your question and I will answer. I'm looking. I let people unmute themselves. So if you want to talk, you can. Okay. My question, hi, Pam. My question is, um, how did you decide uh, what you were going to change for the sake of the story and what you were going to keep real? Oh, hi, Suzanne. Hi, Pam. Um, I, I decided that the only thing I wanted to do was because I wanted it to be the journey of being a writer. And I think that part of the journey of being a writer is also living with silence and pain. So I decided in that way, though I never had selective mutism or any kind of mutism in my life, I decided to make that her experience. And that's a really good question, Suzanne, who was also another 
great editor of this book and also my co-teacher. So that, but there was a diary and I also, I did reflect throughout the years like about my mother's illness and there were times where I really did think that it was, she was schizophrenic, she was wired differently. And there were times I thought, but maybe she was forced into a life that she didn't wanna leave. And maybe for some people that makes them a certain kind of crazy. I mean, for all the women in that generation who got married because they thought they had to get married, for all that women, the women in that generation had children because they had to have children and maybe wanted a, a different journey um, and, and so that was a big part of what I have pondered over the years, even though I obviously don't have the answer to it. So some of this is just conjecture. And someone asked, why does Penelope change her name every year? Um, I don't know why I didn't keep my mother's diary. I think I was so angry at her and it wasn't, I grew up just being angry with her. That's like, what I remember the most from my childhood is rage against her. I acquired much more compassion, but it took getting older to do that. And the reason Penelope changes her name every year from my students in the house is, you know, we talk a lot about fairy tales and changing um, your identity. Like, I think I didn't know my identity at all. I was trying to figure it out. And I thought, and I did like changing my name. I didn't, I don't think I did it every year, but I definitely like playing around with names. I think it was because I was so amorphous, I'll say, or without identity that like giving myself a new name felt like it would connect me to a new person, whoever that person might be. Um, Pam, okay, I, Maddie I, has a question. I, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I find the book just beautiful and moving and funny and 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 I think it's very courageous of you to have written this. And Thank you, Maddie. I mean, it felt like my most honest book because I think, you know, the idea of appropriation now is really huge. And and I think that that when they say anyone owes it to himself, herself, itself, their self to write your own story. That's really true. Yeah. And not other people's stories. And so thank you. And when did I decide, Linda asked, when did I decide to, um, um, to, let me see. I saw something from Linda, but I can't. Linda asked, when did you decide to write this book? Was it a challenging decision? I decided to write the book when I met with my editor of HarperCollins in 2017. And he said, why don't you write your own story? Your own story sounds so compelling. And then I thought, why don't I write my own story? Of course, when I sent it to him, he, he loved it. But he said, you know what? We have so much, we're flooded with middle grade fiction now. I mean, I sent it directly to him without the agent because he wanted to see it when it was finished, that I don't think I want to take on it. I mean, it's all about money, <laughs> you know? And so he thought if I take on one more middle grade book, I don't know which one I'll end up putting more energy in, the marketing team. I said, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I, um, and I'm, I'm glad in a way that he suggested it because I may not have written it. And I'm really proud of this book. Thank you, Kat. I, I did took it, take it into the 21st century. I, I really tried to do that. I, and I tried to, but certainly it was also, I had sensitivity readers for the Muslim character and also the um, transgender character because that's really important. You can't publish a book, get a book published with a character whose world is not your world unless it's been read um, and tested by other people who really know that world. So even your secondary characters have to be tested by other readers. And I'm glad I did that. And I made some changes. 
Karen actually knew someone who um, read the book and really supported it. So that was really great. But that was one of, of a few. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, I answered that, and I answered that. How was it like fictionalizing my story? I think it was really great to fictionalize my story, if truth be told, because I just thought one of the things, I'm not sure if Annie's still here anymore, but years ago we wrote a picture book together, A Wish Upon a Star, a about having a mentally ill mother. And it was rejected by a publisher who was really interested in it because it was so true to my life that, that it was almost like spilling a can of beans and no one wants to read a can of spilled beans. So I gave it to Addie who um, really reshaped it. It's a wish upon a star by Imagination Press. And it really had the distance. I think if you tell your life verbatim, you know, hold your life up to, in, to a mirror, you don't have the right clarity. And I actually like, for some reason, especially um, from the perspective of someone like myself who loves talking a lot, having a character who did not talk. Because remember, when you're not talking, and when you're silent, you're observing a lot. And it gives you a much sharper, that was really fictionalized. And that gives you a much sharper vision and perspective into other people in your audience. And it made me look, and this is like not just fact, but reality. It made me look at my dad with more clarity um, in positive ways and negative ways. Because obviously I was a you know a single child raised mostly by my dad, so he became a kind of hero to me. And it was when I was writing the book, I saw the the great aspects of him, but also the danger of not telling the truth to to uh, a, a young person who is very astute. He didn't tell me my mother died, but he told me other untruths. Um, and, and I know he was trying to protect me, but it didn't always work. It, and so that's what, what I, um, why I, that was the biggest things I, I fictionalized about. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, you have to have, I think I cut one of my, um, thesis students now and, um, she just said the sensitivity reader is really good advice. And before Amber wrote the blurb for me, she actually asked me, did you have a sensitivity, did you have sensitivity readers for Zena and for Johnny? Because she wasn't willing, and I totally agree with her, to write the blurb unless she knew that this was okay. Because by writing a blurb, that's showing support of a book. And if you're supporting a character's view, for example, of a transgender character, and you don't really know anyone who is, and you haven't read, you know, run it by someone who is, then that's problematic. So it was a good thing. Do I have an interest in writing a memoir? I don't think so. Um, good question, Maddie, but I don't think so. I like um, fictionalizing. Uh, these are great questions. Anything else that anyone wants to say, ask in chat or in person? Or um, what was the hardest part of writing this novel that touches on so many important issues? I think the hardest part of writing the novel was realizing um, you know, that big hole inside of me that I grew up with, that was the hard part. But the positive spin on the same issue was how I managed to, at least in adulthood, um, you never fill up the hole, but I managed to um, 
to make myself feel better and do better things that make me feel good in the world. So I don't feel like this deprived per person the way I did when I was growing up. And what is my next project? I actually, I'm just writing poetry for fun, which I'm going to do for the next year. And I have an idea percolating in my mind, um, but I can't, I don't want to really go there with this idea until next year I may be on sabbatical at work and then I, I will pursue it. Because someone approached me about wanting to, to write a book, um, which was her son's story. And it's such a great story and it touches on issues that are very important to me as well. And I said, let me think about it. And I'm thinking for a long time. You know, I haven't said yes or no yet, because like I said, this year I always, my first love was always poetry. And, you know, I, I, I ventured into this kind of writing, but now I wanna go back to poetry for a while when I have time to write, which lately has not been very much because of my three thesis students, all of whom are here tonight, um, were there aspects of your life you found myself revisiting? Um, yeah, I think I was revisiting that, that big hole, but I think the good part was I, when I explored it, I realized I don't feel it anymore, which is not to say I don't feel lonely and sad and depressed sometimes, who doesn't? But I don't feel that big hole that needs to be filled. And that feels like a really big deal. But I, I, I recreated a lot of the spaces. I brought my grandparents in and, my, and, and, and that was great. I brought in, I have really wonderful friends in Queens. I, I situated the book in Brooklyn when I was growing up in middle school. And I, I, I brought up the secrets that we kept from one another. And that was really interesting to explore that, how I would never encourage a young person anymore to ever, ever keep secrets buried inside themselves. Like I would, always encourage a young person to find some venue, um, a good friend or therapy, good, good friends, good therapy, whomever you can reach out to, as long as it's not locked in a chamber. So that was a good question. Um, other questions? I do have to say all my thesis students are here tonight, the three, Sherry and, and Kat and Alexis, Lexi and um, a former one, Karen is here. And it's not just a wonderful thing. It's only taking up this semester because I have three, a lot of my time, but uh, it's okay. I, I think that I'm at the point in my life where I'm getting as much joy in helping people to create their personal visions as I do when I create my own. Because you're really, I mean, it's their voices, it's their stories, but you get, as an outsider, you get to, to, to put your hands into their clay in a little bit, not like full force, but enough, enough touching that it feels good. And it feels like it's not, of course, wholly original writing, but it absolutely is. It's an invaluable role that I really love. And I know my thesis students know that. Uh, and all of you who are here, some of you in different ways and shapes and forms have shared in this journey as either an editor, a reader, a blurb writer. Thank you again, Amber and Suzanne, a friend, um, family. And um, 
it's good. That's all part of the story. I, I mean that in the beginning, in the epigraph, when it says, everyone has a story, even you. My mother actually, she did say that to me. It's like when I was young growing up, I could only, um, I couldn't appreciate anything about her because I was too angry at her. But when I got older, I mean much older, what I did see was that that she had, um, you know, she wrote on napkins, she wrote on toilet paper, like she always wrote. And she, she really used those words that everyone has a story, even you. But so I like the idea of to get to that story, which is your story. It's really a, a process of discovery. And it really was that process of discovery for me. And when I say in the beginning, which is um, definitely fictional, like you can't use my play because I don't know the ending. I, it really comes from that place. Not That's not memoir material, but that's me, the writer. Like I wanna see where a story is going before I take it out to the world. So, and that's what the writing process is, I think a little bit is uncovering your story, which we all have. So um, any other questions? These have been great questions. Oh, and Jennifer is here tonight, who is also my TA and um, thank you. And just everyone who's here tonight, I really, and very grateful for your time and attention to this because I know the evening is really great, at least for me, it's great TV time. Um, <laughs> at the end of a very long day, that um, it depends what your schedule is. I'm a very early morning person, so by the evening I'm done. But it's very exciting to be here and sharing my work with, with all of you. So any final questions? I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Amber. You're better than TV. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> Except I'm watching Dope Sick now. It's pretty grueling and um, very intense. Really not, not to be compared with anything in my book. Uh, Thank you everyone who, who came this evening and please wait around because I think Carolina has something to share with you about the bookstore and other readings. And she told me about a, a picture book author who just recently came to the bookstore. And I was so excited because I read about this person's journey in a, a New York Times article. And I also want to share one additional thing, which is only, it's not really related, but in my job as director of poetry outreach, and I think Carolina would be interested in this, and it might make people from the community come out to the New York City Poetry Festival on May 6th, that Reginald Dwayne Betts is the featured guest poet on May 6th. And um, for those of you who don't know, he just won the MacArthur Award and his poetry is really quite remarkable. So if I'll try to record it for those of you who can't make it there, and we're hoping to do it in person. And thank you, Angela. And you were also a very early reader of the book, which is really exciting. And I'm going to encourage you to, um, maybe purchase the books from Word of Bookstore, especially from um, there over Amazon. They have enough business, <laughs> too much business, I might say. And, and think about, we need to keep these little bookstores alive. It's really breaking my heart that these little bookstores are, have really suffered during COVID. And so, like the first one, I thought I 
wanted to do a book launch. Of course, the fantasy was in person. The first place I thought of was Word Up Bookstore because I know I have given readings there in the past in person. And it's such a great community bookstore, really serves Washington Heights so well that, um, and I'm urging all of you to support your local bookstore and also buy my book, of course. Okay, Caroline, I'll let you take over. No, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm gonna put the link um, to our website where you can buy the book, uh, The Lost Language of Crazy. Um, and also if you're in the neighborhood, we have copies in store. Um, but thank you so much for this reading. All, everyone's questions were amazing. Your answers were amazing. Um, and yeah, if you want to check us out, we're at wordupbooks.com. We have a lot of upcoming events. Um, tomorrow we have a book launch for the Wild, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed, uh, which is a collection of Latinx authors, um, which we're really excited about. Um, this the kids book that Pam was talking about is called Theo Stutu. Um, it's about a young boy who, uh, from a mixed culture, uh, who wants to wear a tutu for his recital. And uh, people are asking him why. Um, and it's really wonderful. Um, we have the event uh, filmed. So if you want to watch that and other events that we've had in the past, uh, check out our YouTube page, youtube.com slash wordupbooks, um, where we have a lot of our um pandemic era events on there um and yeah thank you so much pam again this was great we hope in the springtime when things are feeling a little bit more secure that we can have an event in store um and outside when the weather is nicer and uh we hope to see some of you guys at our store which is right here yes i want to i want to also applaud my audience for you know sticking by me and and coming to these things and my events and supporting my writing because it really means it it means everything to me it really does and suzanne i took your advice i did not offer the students extra credit for <laughs> coming to hear me i just thought and and so even without making that offer, one of them raised his hand and said, if I come hear you and buy your book, will I get um, extra credit? And I said, I'm going to quote Professor Wayne on this. And I said, absolutely not, because then it's like I'm bribing you to come to the event. It feels so much like the way I treated my kids when they were younger, where I bribed them to do anything, like leave the house. <laughs> And I said, but if you want to come hear me and listen to the reading, I would love for you to come. Of and course, no one came. No, you didn't come. Credit, um, forget it. It wasn't worth it. It was still a great event. It was I want to watch it event. later. Yeah. This was recorded. And, and it was better watch. without them, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Can you guess who it was? Infi Infinite? Yes! <laughs> He's a suck up. <laughs> He's only running an A plus, but I think he thinks he could get even better. Good night, everyone. Thank good you night. so much. Have a good night. I, Bye. I can't.